Uh, following Camilla is going to be hard. She is a, <laughs> she's a top-notch developer. A um, little bit about my background is I, I used to be a developer. Um, I've been in management for 13 years where I've um, done very little with production code. Um, but I got my start um, like so many of us back in the, in the, in the early uh, 80s or some before, some a little later. I uh, had a big 20 Commodore 64. I would pound around on them and do some, some programming, um, but never really did a, a complete product kind of a, kind of a, a <coughs> So as I got into the Amiga, which I joined the club around 2017, stumbled in there when I, when I was looking for a, 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 a machine online on eBay, and one of the club members was selling stuff out of the abyss. <laughs> Uh, so he said, well, why don't you come to the club? And I said, there's a club. And sure enough, um, they've come in ever since. Uh, so one of the things I was thinking would be cool to, to learn a little bit more about the Amigo would be to, to, to do some programming on it, um, learn a little more, a bit more about what, what things like coppers and blitters do, um, but was not quite ready to jump into like full bore assembly language to, to really you know stroke the the machinery at the hardware level. I looked around and I thought, well, um, did basic back on the, the Commodore 64, might as well continue the trend, do some basic on the Amiga. I um, was happy to find Blitz Basic to see it was a compiled language so that you, um, you, know, you get, the, get a little bit of a, of a speed boost compared to the old interpretive versions of basic. Um, so I started playing around with some sample programs, um, one of them that I typed in, um, you know, just like the good old days, just typing out of a magazine was a was a breakout, you know, brick breaker type of a program. Um, very, very, very rudimentary, obviously. But you know, total a, a page, page and a half of code. Um, so I kind of like that, dug into it, and, um, and enhanced it quite a bit. So what I thought I'd do today. Um, not going to be a Blitz Basic expert, <coughs> but I can take you through at a high level uh, some of the things that I learned um, working with Blitz, and uh, a little bit about what I learned around about you know general game development. Um, it's one of those things that is really not you know, like many things. It's really not that, that uh, difficult when you get into it. The, the basics. Um, obviously, you can dig into some, some pretty sophisticated stuff on specific use cases, but just just the logic of the game up and running is, is pretty straightforward. So, um, so this um, this game that I made, uh, um, it it um, can has a high score screen, can record high scores. These are some things I added to it that, that it didn't have originally. Um, I, I I drive it instead of things being hard coded in there. I drive it things off of a data file, with the idea that <coughs> eventually if someone could. You know, create their own data file, create their own, own screens on this, um, or maybe even go as far as creating some sort of an editor so that any user can come and create what I'm calling a world in, in this game. Um, this one uses no sprites, so this uses all, all Blitz basic glitter commands to move pixels around. Um, so I've got my own um, collision detection in there that that's, um, seems to work pretty well. Uh, so all the all the all the graphics are shape files. Um, I said no sprites. Um, I wanted some old school beeps and boops, so I so I used the sound routine to generate some some sound files. And to play mod files for background music. Um, so let's go through some of the things that I added. Place mod file for background music. Um, I chose Blitz Basic two specifically um, because my understanding is three. Um, add some enhancements for AGA chipset and, and so forth, and I was just interested in targeting just a, a, a base, uh, maybe Amiga 500. Um, didn't want to tackle any AGA stuff with, with this at, at this time. Plus, arguably, argue, I'm not a graphics artist. This is a brick breaker program. I chose a, a five bit plane palette for 32 colors, and I probably am only using like seven. <laughs> so. Uh, but if I ever do get hooked up with a graphic artist who wants to beef this up a little bit, I'd be happy to throw their art in there. Um, so let's 
let's see here. That's kind of the intro spiel. fantastic installer package for, for Blitz Basic 2 that's got everything in there. So it made that real easy. And then I used Deluxe Paint 4 for the for the graphics. <coughs> um, so you can see in the comments here, um, this started out as, um, as me just typing in the blitz out sample from Roy Ferguson in Amiga format. Uh, don't know if Roy's around. He's probably not watching today, but I figured um, throw him out the, the kudos and the credit for getting me started. Um, even though I've enhanced it a lot, I'm still using his basic logic on collision detection and his basic physics on, on redirecting the ball direction when it hits the, the paddle at the bottom. <clears throat> um, that's about all that's remaining of his code at this point, <laughs> but um, but it was a great inspiration and got me going. Um, some things about about um, Blitz Basic is it has this this Blitz mode and it's got an Amiga mode, so when you're doing um, like disk operations, um, you have to be in the Amiga mode to like read a text file and write a text file and, and do some stuff like that. <clears throat> um, when you're using the the, 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 the blitter command, it needs to be in the blitz mode. So it, it bounces around um, a bit as we go through different routines. But it's like the media mode is like coming through the libraries of the operating system. Yeah. The blitz mode is like hitting the hardware or something. Exactly. Yeah. 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 If you're hitting, if you're hitting, that's, uh, that's a good way to say it. If, if you're hitting operating system libraries, you got to be in that Amiga mode. some variables defined. Don't want to spend a lot of time up here um, when I get down to the code, but, but a lot of, of, of what I call global variables up here to, to control some of the, 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 the screen, the building of the bricks on the screen, um, sound effects volume, um, the menu option counter for when you're scrolling through a menu, what have you. <coughs> um, so let's um, actually do we want to, do we want to like a quick look at it before we get too far into the yeah the code? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I will warn you this runs most of the time. There's some memory error where sometimes the compile and run just won't compile and run. But <coughs> okay. So. So I haven't put a lot of work into the art on the on the screen here. It'd be great to have you know something, something better there. Um, <coughs> it's um, it's using the joystick right now to control the, the selector, and um, I've got the joystick mapped to keyboard on emulation, so it, it's just, I can go around and select different things here. So. So there's um, the leaderboard, 
once again, pretty rustic on the leaderboard right now. Um, I, I do have a, a couple of different easy leaderboards. It, it's hard to tell the difference. Like the first name, Isaac Hard, Easy, Hard C, Easy C. I've got actually four difficulty levels defined in there. <coughs> um, one of my thoughts was, um, since I run the game competition here, um, some of the time, sometimes the games um, don't don't translate well for a competition, especially if you're going to do it online, because there's um, a lot of things that people can tweak and stuff on the on the game as far as like maybe extra lives or continues or different stuff. So I wanted to put in some like competition difficulties, if you will, that would like lock everything down. So the hard mode gonna... is the hard mode, and you have a set of top scores for that. Yeah. And one for the easy skip mode, and one right. for the... Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> um, I'm probably going to drop code. I had this, you know how some games have like a code to continue where you left off? I was thinking about maybe something like that with this, but um, after uh, I thought about it a little bit, it just didn't make sense for this kind of a game. There is no about screen. And then I've got some basic options. So instead of having a code to start on a particular level, I was thinking, oh, I can just in the options let you pick a level to start on. Um, a name, these sound effects volumes, your difficulty level, that kind of stuff. And so that's about it for that. Now let's see if it's going to crash. And it crashed. Hey! Hey, now we can see how the debugger works. <coughs> Yeah, it's it's on this copy bitmap here. Possible some bitmap is not initiated or something. Well, I don't know. I, it, it, it's got to be something to do with my logic flow. I, I would think, where sometimes it works or doesn't. Or <coughs> there, I'm thinking maybe there's a problem with just there's only a, so much memory available in the Amiga, and maybe when I'm loading these like large mod files or different things, it's fragmenting memory and I don't have a contiguous block for the bitmap. Right. So I might need to get a little more in, in tune with my memory well, management. Well, how would that work with the U, UAE? Hmm. That wouldn't have the same memory map. Well, no, but inside of the UAE, you'll have a memory map, because you're emulating an, an Amiga chip, so. It's not RAM. Yeah. It uses more RAM. UAE uses as much RAM as you... Yeah, know. I mean, you could do that, huh, Jerry? Set, yeah. set UAE's RAM up to some phenomenal amount. Right, right. <clears throat> I'm not clear if this is if this is confined to chip RAM or if it can run in all RAM. So, Obviously, I mean, the chip RAM is still... In the case of UAE, it's all, it's, uh, it's all RAM. It's all the same. It is on the PC side, but inside <clears throat> the Amiga, it's going to be emulating chip RAM and system RAM. Yeah, there's two, two types. <clears throat> so, this is the gameplay. And I do have it using a mouse now for the controlling the, the, the bat. And the, the mouse button belongs to the ball. <coughs> can, you um, get, can you get the ball spin? <clears throat> can I make the ball spin? I probably could. <laughs> That's that would that would be it'd be pretty simple. I just have to to draw the frames of the animated ball. No, no, no. I mean, there used to be a trick with the old breakout game. Oh, where you flick the thing when it hit. Oh no, I don't have that kind of physics <laughs> built into this. <laughs> 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 so, but, wait, wait, you, so you do have kind of two <coughs> two ways of hitting the ball. It's on the edge, so it's going to go in a more yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the way the physics works is it's is it is it does take into account where on the the, the, the paddle the ball hits and its current um, angle, and will adjust that. Because it does seem more to go faster when it's on the horizontal. Well, yeah, yeah, it does. <clears throat> so then, once you clear the level, next one comes up, and so forth. I've got got four levels defined right now that this can that it can play. Right now, it gives you an extra ball when you go for level. It, it, you might notice to change the background mod file that it plays. And that's all driven by the data file. <coughs> and 
And the screen right now is generated kind of algorithmically. So I can tell it, you know, go so many rows down. I can tell it to, to you know, use, use, use every row or skip rows. I can tell it to skip columns, get more like a checkerboard kind of effect. Um, so that's what some of those variables at the front are. It reads those in and it'll... I mean, can you walk us, can you walk us through that setup exactly? Oh yeah, 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 we'll get that. <coughs> so, so yeah, I think that's probably all we need to look at. So here. the layout of the bricks is random or in your data file? Um, so the, 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 um, the pattern you see will be the same every time because the parameters will be the same for every level. It does pick random brick um, patterns, like the, the hard or the P or the, the little YouTube thing. It'll pick the actual brick graphic randomly when it fills the screen. Um, oh, it looks like it crashed again. So you just lost because it's a lot Oh, I did. Okay. Okay. There we go. I was trying to. I was trying to lose. I was talking and losing at the same time. <laughs> no, you're talking and not playing. So have you gotten to the point where you write an icon for it that you can just double click? Um, it, 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 it's not a custom icon, but yeah, there is an icon that you can click and launch from. And I have gotten to the point where I can take this, <coughs> with a, like an ADF, <coughs> to my 500, and, and play it there. <coughs> with all the same bugs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is your uh, laptop, Father Jerry, uh, RAM-based or I'm not sure I follow. Okay, usually RAM is usually for games. <coughs> and chip is for graphics. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's what we were talking about earlier is, is well, the way Blitz works, I'm not sure which one it is. Is it listed in that? Um, oh, it's a legal memory for anything? Pardon? You can't set the memory it uses for anything? Um, I, I think that different commands use different memory on this, if I remember correctly. Oh, oh what does it use? Oh, um, don't know, Kenny. Mm. We'll have to look it up later. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> um, so anyways, um, in general with a, with a game, you have a loop or a, or a nested loop that, 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 that runs it. You'll have this, this game has a, an outer loop that basically runs through all the menuing options, and then when you start the game, it starts a, an, an internal game loop, if you will. And with Blitz Basic, um, you cannot call, they call them statements, like I think with subroutines. You cannot call a subroutine unless it's been defined ahead of the calling area in the code. So it, it always seems like you're traveling your code backwards because you're always calling routines that have been defined ahead of time in the source code. Hmm. So. <coughs> Is that the way basic work? Gosh, I can't well, remember. Well, I, I, you know, it's just, I can't remember exactly. I, I remember way back in college there were, there were languages that worked that way because they were yeah. basically like a, like... Can't you do a go-to and just call it down? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are they numbered lines? I know some programs work. The, not in this one. In some work this one has the concept of labels. Uh -huh. okay. oh. <clears throat> um, so anyway, I set up some bitmaps for the for the screens. I, I, I've been trying to switch this over to double buffering, which I think is mostly working, although when I was reviewing this last week before the, the show, I saw a statement where I was like, hmm, I'm not sure I quite did that right. <laughs> But we can get into that later. Um, like I said, everything's done with the blitter moving bits. So um, cube, the, the cubelet command is what I use to, to move a lot of move ball around. And um, there's a lot of modes for that. The, 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 the cookie mode is basically just saying take whatever the shape is and stick it on there, kind of cookie cutter. It has other, other modes that will do different effects, like it'll just like, like black out whatever the shape is, it'll just like black that area out on the screen, or like do like a reverse video kind of effect, or mm -hmm. different stuff. Um, but I wasn't um, wasn't needing any of those kinds of um, <coughs> of um, features. 
Um, make a little boing ball. Pardon? Make a little boing ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I do a, 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 a just some some housekeeping to to prepare the screen. Um, just basically get a the screen set up. Um, the generate sounds was one that I was one I kind of enjoyed doing. Let's see if we can find that. It's more towards the top. There we go. <coughs> um, so, um, so Blitz has this concept of um, of sounds, and you can, in this you can see I'm setting up three different sounds, and there's a, a link to the sound. I believe that's like in milliseconds. It's like I think that's just like a second. Um, and then they, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set sound data. I'm gonna kind of poke sound data right into this, the sound object. Um, so I've got a, a, a value that I'm gonna poke into there. I got an incrementer, and then, then it wants you to, wants the pitch. So you can see, I, it's got this init sound to create that sound object. Uh, you assign it a number, like so many things in basic, you give it a number. Um, I'm gonna make four different sounds. I figured out one different sound, like when you're navigating the menu, compared to when the ball hits the bat, or the bat hits the wall, or, or what have you. Um, so then you give the, the length and the pitch. And then I do this inner loop that I think I'm doing like a sawtooth wave from back in the 8-bit days, where I take that, that value and just go from 90 up to 120, and then I drop it back down to 90, up to 120, down for that <laughs> second's like, worth of sound. Is there like a volume? <coughs> is the value, value in volume? Like I think the, it's the pitch. The pitch, is, the pitch is a different, uh, I mean, pitch equals 200. I think what oh, we're right. doing, like, you know when you like listen to, to, to music and they, they show you the little sound wave? The oh. music, you're manually creating the sound wave. Oh, I see. By, by pushing data into that object one data point at a time. Huh. This, the, in the dynamics, it would be the, the volume because the volume goes up and down in the wave, mm -hmm. and that give you that gives you a dynamic, which gives you some tension. Okay. In your ears. Yeah. So it, it's working that way. So it, it does sound like it's a volume setting. Um, I guess it, I, I guess you could think of it that way. Yeah. I mean, when I was doing some different different algorithms in here, I could get some like, like right now it just goes beep, beep, but I had some stuff that was like, like grungy sounding and, mm -hmm. and what have you. Uh, 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 uh. You, should, you should make a, like a wrapper for this routine that just simply lets you type in what the values are, uh -huh. and then you can just play it and like, play the sound. Good again. Play the sound. Yeah. Play the sound. Yeah. That way you could like tweak the settings you like and know which numbers are the ones that. Yeah. So anyways, that, that makes the, the, the fourth little beep sounds that, um, that we'll play. And then we, from there we load the world, and this is the, the data file I was talking about earlier. So let's, oh, let's see here. Let's, oh, because there's not, got the mouse trap. Let's do a stop share. Let's go back. I wanted to just real quick show. <coughs> so just real quick, this is the, the data file I keep referring to. Oh. So it's got a world name, and then it will will have repeating values. We've got a level number, um, the name of the level, and then some paths for the, the mod file you want to play, the background um, level graphic. Um, I also have the bat and the ball as a shape file and the bricks as a shape file, thinking that <coughs> um, if you wanted to, to create your own custom graphics, you could create them and stick them in there as long as they follow the same basic you know, parameters of the, of the sizes that it's expecting. I'm not dynamically you know, interrogating the sizes out of these things. It's, it's 
it's not that quite quite that sophisticated. <clears throat> and then I've just got some 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 different um, values in here that that have to go. I'd have to look at the. Let's see. I don't think I have them in my notes here. <clears throat> Each of these um, represents like um, the spacing of the of the. Um, Horizontal and the, and the vertical, or the rows and columns. Uh, I believe one of these represents like the total number of bricks and something else. Um, for future expansion, this array down here is is something I put in so that you could basically manually just create a level by plugging, you know, either Location. either plugging like just the, I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do like zero one like right here, like this brick here, not a brick here, or even, or get it to the point where you can say. You know, this is the exact brick that I want here. So this is brick number two, brick number eight. Right. You know, and like create a, a whole custom design. Um, don't have that working or, or coded up yet. To, to I read that in, but I don't do anything with it. It, it just does the generated fields. And then you can see it just continues on. Then this is the second, third level, and then um, and then that's all we got. So I just solved one of my bugs. I thought I had four levels in this file, and I only got three. So, <clears throat> one get away from you? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, you're you're, you're out having fun, coding, drinking beer. Weird stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> Put the wrong number in. So I mean, how do you read that file in? So we'll take, <coughs> it might be good to take a quick look up. So there's a low world routine, but let's go a little bit higher. <coughs> um, different, different languages have different ways of creating your own kind of data types or structures or what have you. And in Blitz, we have this new type concept, and I'm creating a level type. And you'll see this right here, all these, this is our documentation, all those mystery numbers you just saw, um, they're right here. So, so um, level number, level name, module path, 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 path. Um, the generated, which is really a flag, whether it's generated or, or you know, to use those, those parameters, or to use that array that I'm not using just yet. Um, column offset, row offset, column count, row count, column spacing, row spacing, and then that array of data. <coughs> so, so, so like D is binary or something, like a number? Like that's a, a byte. byte. A byte and a, the, the, the S is a string and and the dollar sign is string too. Um, I probably use them interchangeably because, you know, different days. <laughs> <laughs> it means the same thing though. Yeah, B, B is, is, is bytes. And you have bytes and you can have longs and you can have words, I believe it is. So that's where you define the variable type? So, yeah, the yeah, the dot, yeah, dot s is, is, is the variable type. So but then word. when you refer to the variable, you just say world underscore name, but yeah. you define it as world underscore yeah. name dot s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the dot is just, so that's why when I, when you do your new type, dot level, that's your, your data oh, type right. is, a, is a dot level. So, and then I've got a, a list of levels here, um, 99 levels, um, and it's it's of type level. So we, we define this up above as a type, and then we have so you've hard coded it to have 99 <coughs> levels, although you're only loading three. Right, right. Seemed like a good number at the time. <laughs> you know, if memory's an issue, maybe you change that number down to nine. Maybe. But it's it'll it, it'll be empty. The rest of it will be empty. Well, now but you have now you've got ninety six empty levels, right? Right. Instead of having just six empty levels, does right? It, does it allocate the memory for all that stuff? Yeah, I'm unclear. Uh, yeah. It's pre-allocated, or it's more like a linked list internally. Uh, I don't know. Um, but to load the world, um, the Q Amiga here. That's what takes us back to that Amiga mode, so we can do those OS commands. Um, they also have this, a lot of languages have this too, it's a, a little shortcut where you don't have to, to like, 
type as much, basically. So with this use path levels, um, I don't, when I access the levels array, um, I don't have to type levels anymore. That's what all these little slashes are here, slash number, slash name, slash botoon. When you, when you set the use path, then that slash becomes your, your levels there. And you can do that with, with, with other, other, other uh, well, I guess you mainly do it with lists. That's where I see it used mostly. Um, so then anyways, just do a, a refile. And um, I, I generate the, um, the path to the, to the um, data file there. I concatenate a, a, basically a constant from above with the, with the file name. And then um, while that in the file, just load that level data. And then of course close it at the end, go back to blitz mode. So when you're in the, uh, the Amino less mode, you could write a programming that uses multitasks in the operating system and all that. Yeah, yeah. But when you're in blitz mode, what does it take over? <coughs> Yeah, I think in blitz mode it wants to be, you know, it, it takes over. I do think it takes over because it's expecting. I think it's expecting exclusive control of the blitter. So multitasking is found. Good question. But let's say you can change it on the flyer and within your whole. You, know, you don't have to have one node for the whole program. You can change it anywhere. Anything yeah. You want. Yeah, anywhere you need the the to change it, you can just change it. <coughs> Go back down to where we were. <coughs> um, so we've just launched the, the program. So it does the, the background music and it um, that goes into that first loop, which was that menu we saw where you could choose to start the game or go into the high scores or the options. And if you choose game, that's where the where it will call the game loop. So if we scroll up a little bit, like the leaderboards and the options <coughs> code is up here. Um, not much to the leaderboard and options code. It's it's very much similar to what you just saw with starting it up, where it just brings up another screen, it's got another menu, it can it can can select different different things to do from those menus. So then we got our game loop, and it, we, as you know, we, from that world um, load world, we've got the level data. So, um, so we've got a load level routine here. Do the mega mode because we're gonna use that level data to put our, our background bitmap for that level up. Um, <coughs> um, I copy the bitmap so that I can use it the fresh version to do repairs. So that it's moving bits around, like when a brick gets hit, I've got to replace it with something. So I use the fresh one and copy that over. Bill said he's trying to get warnings. Oh. I don't know what that means. Bandwidth. Could be. Um, and then we load the, the shape files for the bat ball and bricks and load our, our music. Um, go back into blitz mode. Um, create a slice. <coughs> um, my understanding is, of course, use the blitter to, to on the screen. We've got to create this, this concept of a slice, which has. Um, Slice number, 
It starts on scan line 44, which is kind of a magic number they recommended for making sure that your your monitor's visible, your scan line on your monitor is visible, and then five bit planes. Where's this document? This is kind of assuming you're like NTSC. Let's see here. Like, uh, I mean, assuming that, I mean, I guess that's basically basic when you open up the screen, it's going to be a whatever it is. Probably into the CD or something. This is surprised that it's indexing scan lines. This is normal for 68 game machines. That seems a little low level. Well, yeah, yeah. When you're when, when you're dealing with a game, the scan lines are kind of important. You want to you want to do all your game logic within one screen. Well, bear in mind, you're game. also do, using you're driving the blitter when you do this, right? Yeah. So you're, you're essentially setting up the programming of the player, right? Man. It's old school, man. No kidding. Let's see here. Let me look at the big 20 here. <laughs> Slices. Slices of Blitz 2 objects, which are the heart of Blitz mode. Blitz mode's powerful graphic system. Through these are slices. Many weird and wonderful graphical effects can be achieved. Effects not only possible in Amiga mode. This includes things such as dual play field displays, smooth scrolling, double buffering, and more. And this PDF is part of the distribution, yes? Yes. Yep. Yep. This is all in there. So it's. Um, Blitz mode's main feature is its flexible control of the Amiga display. Its control is achieved through the use of slices. Slices may be thought of as, as a description of the appearance of a rectangular area of the Amiga's display. This, this, this description includes display mode, color palette, sprite, and bit plane information. More than one slice may be set up at a time on different areas of the display to take on different properties. But there are some limitations. Slices may not overlap, must not be positioned horizontally beside each other, must be on top of each other. Um, if you specify an area for a slice, you only have control over the, sli the slice's vertical position, its width, and height. Slice's horizontal starting position will be automatically calculated. So, so they go and throw all that, and then they kind of get here and say, "We're not going to tell you really how it works." <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the magic of Blitz is how it works. <laughs> so then they give some some examples down here. So that is that's the docs on a slice. When was the last time Blitz was updated? Um, well, I think that there's Blitz 3. I don't know if it's currently being updated or if they're just continue, continuing to keep the old stuff alive. But for, for, for Blitz 3, I've seen where they can do um, PC-based development and, and like cross-compile it. I'm not quite sure how that works. I um, really haven't gotten into Blitz 3 that much, but I don't I don't know if there's anything beyond that, really. So just maintaining their bugs or something, like just maintenance of the Blitz 3? I, I don't even know, I don't even know if, they're, if, they, if it's even actively maintained right, right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't really looked into it. I figure once I'm done playing with this, I probably won't do much with Blitz after this. But who knows, maybe I will. So now you have uh, a whole new way to program stuff in C. 
Yeah, you know, I've never been been seed friendly myself. <laughs> Which is why I chose basic gear. I actually I actually enjoy assembly more than I do seed. <laughs> oh, game. Okay. Let's see here. Where's our game blue? Where's our game blue bat? There we go. Back to the game. Oh, that's the main. So, oh, leaderboards farther up to the game blue. I'm going to go up and down real quick so the people online can get a little buzz out of the scrolling. <laughs> there we go. So I believe, I believe we, we've gone off on low level there, right? Um, set of game defaults is, is, is housekeeping. That's not much interest there. Um, the generate play field, that might be, be fun to look at. That's the routine that uses those parameters to, to, to build the brick pattern. So basically, we've got the, um, the the rows and columns in that um, data file that are going to control the, the, the number of, of loops we do here. And then, um, well, I should say, yeah, the, the, we're going to control these inner and outer loops. And then the row spacing variables will say for like skipping that row or column when, we, when we're building this, uh, this, this play field up. Then, uh, if we're not in a valid row or column, we're just putting zeros out. But if we are in a place where we can put a brick, then we will say, yeah, we placed a brick. We keep a brick count so that we can tell when we hit them all. Um, and then we'll like, we've got 10 shapes. So this is where we pick our random shape that we're going to put up there. Um, and then the, I have to add two because it's an offset. If I, if I did my shapes properly, I wouldn't have an offset at the top, but I, I, I do have this right now. So, do you, is, In the harder modes, do the bricks come down closer and closer to the... Bricks do not move at this point. Oh, okay. I, I thought about that, but that's not something that I'm, I'm ready to, to put into it. <laughs> I, I think the, if, the next enhancement I'd like to do is more like a power-up kind of a system, where when, like an Arkanoid, where you hit a brick and then it drops something, and then you hit it and you get a second ball, or your title goes big, your title goes small, or something like that. I think it would be, be kind of fun to do. But the Tetris thing where it comes not come down further and starts to block you makes it much, much harder because you don't have much time between oh, yeah. sending stuff up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I blit the shape in right here. And you might notice this isn't a cubelet, uh, but we haven't really got the cubelet yet. But there's a, there's blit and there's cubelet. Blit will just blast the shape up there, it's fire up get it real quick. Um, if you use a cubelet, it's actually associated with a Q, Q-U-E-U-E, Q, -U -E -U -E -Q mm -hmm. and it will, it will repair the damage and then it, that it's made um, when you, when you un it. So that, that helps with that though. Screen repair, so that you don't have like a ball that like leaves a trail behind it because you're not repairing the screen as it moves. But when we're putting the bricks in, we just just do a straight a straight blit. The update scoreboard just puts the, the labels and the scores on that right hand column there. And goes into Amiga mode and just has a font and just prints up to the screen at a location. So that's not much of that. And then I display the level name um, before we get going. <coughs> um, 
got to check for make sure that we um, that we, we haven't run out of, of lives or balls and that we haven't gone past the last level here. Um, I, I set the ball start it's, um, an angle. Um, didn't didn't have that initially, so it was kind of crazy when you lost the ball because it was like going back and forth real quick. Then you'd launch it and keep going back and forth real quick and. Um, hard to get restarted, so I, I make sure that's set so it's going to come down to a nice soft angle so you can get restarted nicely. And then we press the button or the mouse button or, or the joystick uh, fire button. We'll, we'll drop the ball. <clears throat> and then we're in a real tight loop here where basically it's like if the ball hasn't fallen through and you haven't hit all the bricks, we just keep doing this one little tight loop here where we, we move the ball, we move the bat, um, we update the scoreboard, and, um, and loop back around. Print stuff is a bad name. Print stuff is where it actually updates the screen. The, the move ball and move bat are all calculations, and the print stuff is actually commit that to the screen so that the user can see it. And then in the in the in the movement in the ball movement is where it does the collision detection to see if it's hit anything, um, so that the print stuff routine will know what bricks to erase or or, or you know, what scores to add and all that kind of stuff. Let's see here. The move ball I think is pretty straightforward, or the move bat is pretty straightforward. The move ball I think. So here's the ball. We have some, 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 some variables. Oh, I never really mentioned this. Um, Blitz has this this deal where um, I call them global variables up top, and I say I call them global because in, in most languages a global variable is just there; it's available everywhere. But within Blitz, you do have to tell it through the shared statement um, those variables that you have access to. And if you don't include it in the shared statement, then you have no access to it. Are these the ones that are also in the data file? <clears throat> um, well, in some routines they are. In this one, um, these are, are basically um, the BXBY is the ball's X and Y position. Um, BDX, BDY is the kind of the speed, the, the deltas. Mm -hmm. um, BTX, BTY is the bat position. And then drop is a flag saying it's, it's gone, gone below the the bat. Okay, so these are actually used <coughs> by these functions you wouldn't want to do. So where right. is the where is the initial assignment then? Or they <coughs> assume that when it is shared without an initial assignment it's um, well like the 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 um, um the, the the ball initial assignment is done in that routine we're just at right before we drop the ball. Live streaming has yeah. stopped. Oh <laughs> live streaming has stopped. <laughs> <laughs> so, give me a second so I can plug the key back in so the live stream can start. Can you actually extend it out to two hours? <clears throat> um, I don't think that time is a problem. Okay, let's, let's see here.
streaming is on. Yay! All right, live streaming is back. Well, sorry to audio up on that one. It seems like we've got bandwidth now, but we still had some sort of glitch that dropped our stream. We may be in, in for a technology switch for the weekend for a different streaming product. Thank you, Lee. Send a quick message to the broadcast. So we're back on this, this ball movement. Um, the bat X and Y are, are set at the, at the start of the of the of the game. That just you know as it as it moves, it just keeps track of it throughout the game. Um, and then the ball X Y um, that will get randomized when you lose the ball, and the new one goes to launch. It'll it'll randomize a new a new horizontal position to start from the new angle. So that's what that gets set throughout the game. <coughs> and then I've got some, the, the first part of the ball movement is, is pretty trivial, you know, making sure that I'm not going outside the play field. If I am, I, I, I correct, uh, correct for that. As long as I'm inside the play field, then I can update the position of the ball. <coughs> um, and after I've got my, my ball positions um, figured out, then I can do collision detection. notes that I wrote up on this, and I can put these notes online if anyone's interested in reading through this stuff again. <coughs> um, when, I, when I first typed in the, 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 the magazine version, um, it's basically, you know, when we're tracking this position, we're tracking this top left pixel. That is ball XY, this top left pixel. Um, so you can imagine, since that top left, left pixel is really not the ball, it's actually possible for that top left pixel to hit a brick, but the actual ball shape is hitting the brick next to it, which makes for a very, very odd gameplay when the brick next to the one you hit disappears. So my, my approach to fixing that um, may be a brute force approach, but, but basically I looked at my, my shape and said, well, what I really have here is not one XY collision area, but I have, I've got eight collision areas. Each one of these corners is a collision area. Because if you think about it, the ball can hit a brick traveling up, it can hit the top, come back down and hit a brick. It can be traveling, you know, left, right, hit a brick. So you gotta, you really gotta check 
check the, 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 you know, the corners. Yeah. Couldn't you switch the math so that it thinks that that top left is really four points over and four points down, and then do all the math, four paint points out, and then you'd be tracking center to the edge? I could, but I'd still do a math. Right. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> You would, but then you would only be tracking one point, not eight well, points. I think that if I want to want to get a, a a more striking collision detection, I need to convert this to a sprite. Oh, yeah. and use uh, this collision detection and use it. Yeah, yeah. do yeah. that hardware. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so anyways, I just thought that graphic might be a little helpful before we get into the code. Okay, let's take this down. Stop sharing. So, so then basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm calling it a colliders array, and each of those eight points, well, zero through seven points, <coughs> I'm I'm figuring out if it's if it's any of those points. Well, I'll figure out where they are on the screen, and then I will figure out if that location of the screen contains a brick. So. I took what was essentially the, the single point collision logic and just blew it out to, to eight checks. So there's some there's some additional math in here, and it probably warrants another picture. But when you look at the screen, the screens we looked at, the two we looked at were pretty straightforward because it was like a single line of bricks, two lines of bricks. When you start using some of the um, the other features to like skip rows or columns, where we have where we have blank areas. Um, I don't know why I chose to do this, but rather than represent the way the screen looks and and copy that into the array that I use for my collision detection, all the bricks in, in the in the internally represented are all compressed down. So the way it looks in the array in memory is not the way it looks on the screen. So I've got to do a translation of screen coordinates into a x, y position in my array of bricks, if that makes sense. That's the easier way. Yeah, I could have just said, make the array look exactly like the screen. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier. No, no, no. <laughs> So I'm not sure why I did it that way, but that's what I did. So it, it that's that's why we have some of this um, additional math where we're taking into a, the to the account the column and row offsets here. So and I would and I and I'm dividing my brick row and brick height because I'm wanting to once again compress this down into an X Y and a array and not screen positions. Mm -hmm. my, yep. my, my intro, you know, if I've got 12 bricks across, I've got a 12 element array. Right. All you need to do is you know the width of every brick is and it's consistent. Right. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so that's what a lot of that, that um, math is doing in there. And then basically, I, after I figured out where this, these, these eight collider collision points are in the, in the world, I look through them again, see if they hit, a, hit something. And if they do, I make a note that there is a hit. I also make a note if it was a horizontal or vertical hit so that the physics knows which way to shoot the ball off after it's been hit. But if it always hits the bottom, it would always be... It, yeah, but it doesn't always, always hit the bottom. Yeah, but it might hit the side of the brick. Could also hit the top. Or the bottom of it. But it bounces off the top. It could and come back down. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. So it can hit all four sides. Yeah. So the physics say bounce this way based on the angle first and then the hit. Because, for example, if it comes up from underneath, hits and goes this way because of the, of the momentum going this way. Can you work on that at all? Um, for the most part, um, why would you want to get better doing so? This isn't always working well. I wondered whether that would be. <sighs> but it would be interesting to see if we reversed the horizontal and the vertical, if that, you know, 
helped it out some. Maybe maybe doing one before the other happens more often. So I think, maybe yeah. switching them would, would, would make it look better. Yeah, because it's you think that your hits are going to be more often to the bottom than to the vertical, to the side, right? But and not knowing what your logic, how your logic works, is it possible that you're already doing it the right way? Right. You're checking the vertical hit first. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, of course, I do. I do open the door here to, you know, both the vertical and horizontal hit at the same time. Wait. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. It works a lot. <laughs> it worked. Well, I saw it bouncing back and forth. Yeah, yeah. yeah How long does it take before you hit the anomaly when you're applying it? That, then what's the effect of the anomaly? The ball seems to hit but doesn't, and it passes through it or by it? Or you get false positives or false negatives? Well, that, that's why I need to put in some debugging and figure out when I get a weird physics you know, event, what actually happened. No, 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 but while you're playing, you can see the ball going up, and it looks like it's going to hit. Does it hit or not? Or well, are there times well, when it, it looks like it's not going to hit, and it shows like it did? Well, the, the one that I've noticed the most is like the ball's traveling up to a couple bricks, and it hits the bricks, and you expect it to bounce off, and it looks like it does like a little like jaggy where it like starts to bounce off, but then continues in its original trajectory. Okay. So maybe that's after Very your code find it hitting the vertical, and then the horizontal is going, no, 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 no. And it's like I don't, negating it. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, like I said, it's weird. It's weird. It doesn't happen often. Well, maybe the tachyons are faster than the... What? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hell, he is listening. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let's see here. I was thinking maybe the print stuff because moving the bat, there's no collision detection. It's just you know what the user press, move it this way or that way, and, or if it's the mouse, it just reads the mouse position and puts it there, kind of deal. So it's not a, not a lot of, of interest in the, in the move bat. That's pretty straightforward. And like I said, update scoreboard. Just um, make sure we get the, the score up there. So here's the print stuff routine. That's this is what what after we've done all of our, our calculations of everything that's moving around the screen, this is where we actually show it to the user. Swap it in, and then then that would be the live one, and then you sort of update the other, the previously live bitmap, and then swap it back, uh, back and forth. And I think what I'm doing here is I'm repairing everything all at once, which kind of goes against the whole double yeah, buffering yeah, yeah. idea. Right. Oh. You're actually yeah. single buffering twice. Yes, 
Yes. <laughs> yes. This is this is the the the. the no, there's just call and have two of those blitz right there. Your code will run twice as fast. Exactly. <laughs> but blitz are really fast, so <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, then we do the the ball, and we're using the the the, the, the Q bits to move the ball and the bat. Let's see. Here's some notes from other. Artifacts that I was having. I think I fixed. Even though I don't think I'm doing it right, I'm not getting a lot of weird artifacts anymore. So it's <coughs> it's one of those things where it's like, that are it's like care of that. exactly, exactly. <laughs> because then, um, because with the, with the with the double buffering, I would do the V weight to get to the end of the V weight of the command for your very flat in the bottom scan line, and then. Um, Show the um, show the the um, the buffer, and then switch your buffer pointer to the one that you you know the other one, one right the other one. Um, say you're going to use that one, and then um, and the unqueue is for the cubelets up above. Hmm. So the, the unqueues you know, for for their screen repairs. Hmm. So yeah, okay. this is this is kind of like the double buffering down here. It's just I like, should not be. Doing the screen repair up there on the active on the active bitmap, <laughs> like I am. It's a neat solution to a problem that I really wouldn't exist. Depending on your hardware. Mm -hmm. So let's see. That's pretty much that's pretty much all the interesting stuff. Because after you've done that, <coughs> um, you know, if you lose the ball when you beat the game, you're just falling through the game loops. And either you know, given a game over screen, <coughs> it will check the leaderboard when you when you when you um, when you end. But I don't have a, I haven't gotten as far as where you can enter your name in the leaderboard. Right now, that's just a variable I have in there to put a name in there. I haven't done the. Uh, for some reason, when I got to the point where it's like enter your name, the command for that was was crashing on me every time. Hmm. So I haven't quite got that worked out where you can actually enter your name into the leaderboard. Uh, but I did get to where the save logic works. What about the logic where it uploads the leaderboard to the internet so where everybody can see oh. the <laughs> You know, that would be cool, but my 500 is not connected to the internet, so. <laughs> <laughs> I have this little doohickey that will attach to the bell. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I've heard of those doohickeys. <laughs> They're slow, but they're, they work. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. Without getting into to, to <coughs> more details, you can have your five hundred print out a little postcard that says "My I score was." <laughs> Put stamp here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Did you look at anybody else's brick code? No, it was just, available? just no, just the sample that I started with. Mm -hmm. So the sample you started with was what kind of game? What was it? Um, it, it, it was a, it was a brick. It was another brick couple oh, brick, brick breaking game. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, but it must have been a lot simpler. Than you added up? a lot. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I added a ton to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I remember the sample. It was a really small sample. Right. Right. I, I, the, the the total size of the sample was maybe a page, a page and a half of code. Yeah. How was he detecting collision? Um, if I remember correctly, he was just looking at that the ball X Y. Yeah. The corner. Yeah. See, I keep thinking you can take your ball X Y, divide it by the size of the brick, and that would put you on the coordinates of your grid of bricks, and then. Just see whether or not it's within the diameter of the ball to this. And actually, you'd be the diameter of the ball and the set size, be it width or height of the brick, of each one of the center points of the brick. Uh -huh. One test. And then you just check to see if you're within the horizontal, or within the vertical, and I'll tell you if you hit it on the bottom of the top or on the corner. And you only have one test, four numbers. Two distances and four checks. 
Okay. But you have to get that six pack of beer. You have to grab the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Someone call Brian. He's our beverage guy. <laughs> Okay. I think I'm going to go ahead and um, close down the stream for the day. What are the people saying on the see. chat? Anybody chatting? I don't know. Not you? I, I saw Lionel said that he um, uh, he was we were, you were making sounds without him on the chat. Making sounds without. Him. Well, remember he wrote the music program. He also wrote the uh, soft driver for the X1000 audio file, audio uh, chip. So he's the audio guy. Type things in. Well, Sorry, yeah. was typing things in when I was, I was just I talking was, about uh, uh, Pixie. Yeah, I was just well, I was just looking at the 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 chat. I don't know if mine's updating um, or people just aren't chatting right now. They're probably not chatting. Probably not chatting. They're okay. probably they're probably drinking beer and passing. They, they probably had dinner two or three hours ago over yeah. in Europe. So. Uh -oh. Or on the East Coast. They're having their midnight snack now. Yeah, East Coast is All right. three hours later. Okay, well, for, for those who have stuck through this whole thing, thanks. Appreciate it. Um, my understanding is that this will, be, um, this will be recorded automatically on YouTube. It'll be on our Bill Sammy Watch channel for forever, for those who want to live through it again. Hi everyone. Good night. <laughs> Say good night, Gracie. Live streaming has stopped.